The second reading this morning comes uh, from the Old Testament in 1 Samuel, the third chapter. We're picking up uh, the exciting part of the story, but a lot, of course, has gone before this. We'll talk about that briefly. But this is the Lord's call of Samuel. We're starting what I think is going to be a neat little series just for the next four weeks leading up to Transfiguration of the Lord Sunday, and then we'll be into Lent before you know it. Um, but the lectionary passages in the Old Testament for these next four weeks have really grabbed my attention. We have the call of Samuel today. Uh, we have, and Jesus calling the first disciples. Next week, the gospel is some more of Jesus calling the disciples, um, but also it is Jonah. Jonah's second time around, Jonah's second chance at being the prophet he was called to be. Uh, the third week from now is when Moses promises that God will raise up from the people a prophet like himself, which is, of course, a prophecy about the Messiah, about Jesus. And then finally, the last week, it'll be Isaiah 40 and uh, the promises and the prophecy uh, in its full. So not focusing on a particular prophet, but on the message. So we'll be looking at call and response and Messiah and message over the next four weeks. But this is from 1 Samuel. You can find it on page 270 if you want to read along with me. Uh, It's the third chapter, and I'll read the very beginning of the fourth chapter as well. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. That the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you, Eli asked? Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word, and Samuel's word came to all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we uh, come in on the beginning of a significant chapter in Samuel's life, a big change, but it leaves out, of course, the early part of the story, which is the other part that you're familiar with. Uh, Hannah, one of two wives, and it went as badly for her as you would expect if you were one wife out of two. And uh, one of the big hurts in between her in her relationship with the other wife and her husband was that the other wife had children. Hannah had none. So you remember she went to the temple and she cried out before the Lord, literally weeping before the Lord, asking for a child, and then gave the Lord a promise. If you will give me this child, then I will give him back to you. I will dedicate him to you, and you will, he will live with you and serve you forever. And God answers that prayer. 
After a while, once Samuel is weaned, Hannah brings him to the temple, well, to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, the tabernacle still, and leaves him there. Now, the weekend that we got married, um, we had a couple of pastors in one car. Um, there was the Presbyterian pastor who was going to marry us, and then there was our best man who was a Baptist minister or about to be. He was studying and eventually became a Baptist minister, but died in the wool Southern Baptist who had lost his voice. So he had laryngitis, and the Presbyterian minister did not. And somehow, along the way from the rehearsal to the rehearsal dinner, we got into the subject of infant dedication versus infant baptism. And the Presbyterian pastor won the day primarily because he had a voice, and poor Sean did not. Uh, So Alan was teasing my friend Sean, uh, saying, you know, this whole dedication thing, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about infant dedication. And Sean's sputtering and whispering as loud as he can about Samuel. And uh, Alan pretends not to hear him for a while, and then finally says, well, yeah, you know, but it's not the same. You come and bring an infant and dedicate him before the Lord, but then you take that child home, right? You're not bringing him back and dropping him off at the church and saying, well, this has been nice, but you're going to serve the Lord the rest of your days. It's not the same, he says. He said, you might as well just go all the way and baptize them, make them a a member of the covenant community with all of the privileges as well as all of the obligations that come to us who are baptized, who are part of this community and the family of God. Well, it was an interesting theological argument, but Sean was very frustrated by the end because he just didn't have enough voice to make his way. But this is a strange story for Samuel, right? A strange existence. He's going to grow up in the house of the Lord, which again, essentially is a tent uh, with buildings around it, I'm sure, here at Shiloh. He knows his parents. He sees them every year, every year. But Eli is raising him up. That's not really so bad, except Eli hasn't done a really great job with his first brood, his first couple of kids. His sons are, well, our new translation here says in chapter 2, they were scoundrels, and they were at least that. They were horrible, and they were priests of the Lord. They abused their office. They abused the people. Uh, They led the people astray or prevented the people from worshiping the way that God had called them to. And it is a tragedy and travesty. And Eli knew about it. Eli spoke to them about it. But they um, had contempt for their father as well as for their heavenly father. And they went on mistreating the people. You can find that in the previous chapter. A man of God, a prophet, comes to Eli and says, This will not go on. God's people will worship the way that they are told to worship and the way they are called to worship. And your sons will not prevent them. And your sons will no longer lord it over them and mistreat them and mistreat the offerings and sacrifices being brought to a holy God. And so the prophet tells Eli before Samuel that this is what's going to happen. Uh, his family line is going to come to an end. And his priestly line, his line anyway, will come to an end. No longer will anyone from his family serve as priest before the Lord. Worse than that, the two sons, these scoundrels, are going to die on the same day. Here it says in verse 13 that the sons blaspheme God. Um, Another way to look at that phrase, the way other uh, manuscripts have it translated, is they made themselves contemptible, and they certainly did that. Well, they die on the same day. Eli dies on the same day, and it is a tragedy. But God promises he's going to raise up both a prophet and a priest. He talks about a priest in chapter 2, and he makes Samuel, this child, a prophet in this story. This story grabs a lot of us. It certainly has grabbed me. I can remember um, not any idea how old I was, but I have a very strong memory of where I was sitting in church the day that this story, I really heard this story for the first time. I remember what the light was like coming through the windows, and I remember this back and forth. Samuel, run, 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 run. Here I am. You called me. And Eli, I mean, think what it was like for Eli. He is an aged man. He is nearly blind. And as somebody who has been awakened in the night by a child, you think the first time completely forgivable, right? Right? Here I am. You called me. You're dreaming. I didn't call. Did I call out in my dream? I know I didn't even in my dream. I didn't even call you. Go back to bed. And the second time, a little frustrated, right? Haven't we already been through this? I know I didn't call you. I've hardly been asleep since you were here the last time. We've been through that. But Eli is supposed to be in a different position. Eli is the priest of the Lord. Eli is supposed to be more in tune with the movings and workings of God in this world uh, than many of the rest of us, perhaps. That's why we begin this chapter with, In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Eli was not receiving visions from the Lord. He was not giving the Lord's vision and prophetic words to his people. He is administering, or had been administering. Now his sons were administering the sacrifices. He was not ready 
Eli was not ready for a vision from the Lord. Eli was not ready for a word from the Lord. And sadly, because of that, all the people also were no longer ready. It makes me so angry to read chapter 2 because even the people, uh, people come and bring their sacrifices and again, it's just, it's mistreated all the way. But even those who say, no, 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 at least let me do this according to the law and then do what you want with my sacrifice. And instead, a servant of the priest is grabbing the best parts uh, for the priests and telling them, if you don't give it to me, I'll take it from you by force. Even those people are prevented from being prepared for the word of the Lord to come. But I love this running back and forth. Samuel's in the holy place, actually, because he is where the lamp of God is. And from Exodus on through Leviticus, you have the regulations about the lamp of God. From evening till morning, the lamp of God is lit. That's great if you don't mind sleeping where it's light. Christian likes to sleep when it's dark. This would be a very difficult thing for him to tend the lamp of God because you have to be used to going to sleep when there's a lamp lit. And if it gets dark in the room to wake up because you have to tend to the lamp, Uh, the lamp's going out. You have to make sure there's enough oil from evening till morning. The lamp of God is lit in the holy place. Eli is sleeping in his usual place. And this voice comes, Samuel. Who else could it be? He runs. He hears a call. He comes uh, obediently. Here I am. You called me. And it is a call. It's a call of a prophet. It's a call much more than Samuel can even imagine. And he runs back and forth, back and forth. Finally, it hits Eli. God hits Eli over the head with the two before, and he realizes, oh, it's God. But even then, Eli's not really ready for this, right? I mean, you think of Eli. He gave the right instructions. Mostly, yes. Go and lie down. And if he calls you. Well, he's called three times already. I don't want you to get the impression that if God calls three times and you don't pick up by the third time, then he's just moving on to somebody else. It's not like God has awakened Samuel three times and he hasn't responded correctly. And so therefore God's going to say, I can find another prophet somewhere else. He's going to call again, Eli. Go and lie down. I wish Eli had said, and when he calls you, say this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel goes and lies down. But then this is the other thing that, that even when you think through the story, you sometimes forget. I don't want you ever, ever to forget this image ever again, thinking about Samuel and his whole strange and interesting and miraculous and powerful life. He goes and lies down in his place next to the Ark of the Covenant. And the Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times. The as at the other times is what I'm intrigued by. Was he standing there each of the other times? Probably so. Last week at the baptism of the Lord, the heavens opened and a voice came from heaven. In this case, we are told the Lord stood there. Samuel is in the presence of God, right next to the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim and their wings over the mercy seat. And God's there, standing there, calling him Samuel, Samuel. And that is a powerful thing. Speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. And then we move on to Samuel's a prophet. And he tells Eli what he said. And we forget that he gave him really bad news. This is not a gospel message. Gospel means good news. This is bad news. He tells them that the prophecy Eli's already heard has been confirmed. And Eli has to respond to that. But first, the Lord came and stood there and called him by name. Many people have been called by God to specific forms of ministry. uh, And because of that, we often think that the call, capital C call, is reserved only for a few. And I don't think that's actually the case. The call of a prophet, that is an exceptional thing. It's extraordinary. The call of somebody to ordain ministry of word and sacrament, that is unusual. But the call of God is, goes out to everybody. The one who knew your name before the world was set in place is the one who calls you by name. Because the first call that comes to all of us is not this specific. You are now going to be a prophet set aside for the work of the Lord for the rest of your life. The call that comes to you and to me both is a call to salvation. The same call we saw last week at baptism. This is my child, my son or my daughter, with whom I am well pleased, my beloved one. That's the call that comes to us. That's the call that should make us sit up, hearing our voice and say, here I am. Better answer to sit up and say, speak, Lord. For your servant is listening. We're going to sing Here I Am in just a minute. And it's an interesting thing for lots of reasons, which I can't go into all of them. But here's the thing that most interests me today. The chorus, Here I Am, Lord. Okay, the only times that Samuel said, Here I Am, he wasn't talking to God, he was talking to Eli. 
Here I am, you called me. Here I am, you called me. Here I am, you called me. And then in the morning, when he's hoping that Eli will forget about everything that happened in the night, maybe Eli has slept through it, thinks it's all a dream, and he goes and he opens the house of the Lord and he's serving in his usual place, doing his usual routine. Maybe I won't have to talk to Eli about this. And Eli calls Samuel, my son, and Samuel says, here I am. Okay, don't let that ruin that beautiful hymn for you, but at least makes me smile. If you want to speak to God, then say, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. But here I am, we'll do for a start. Because you're called to salvation. There is a call on your life that has been on your life since before the world began. God wants you to be his own, his beloved, his child, son or daughter of the Most High. He calls you to salvation. And the response is, here I am. I cannot save myself. I cannot enter into eternal life myself. I cannot do all that I am supposed to do in my life. But you, working through me by your Spirit, can do all things. All things are possible to God. Call to salvation. Also, at your baptism, though, you're not only called to salvation, whether you're an infant, child, teen, adult, elder, adult, there is another call that comes on us at our baptism. It is a claim on our lives. And in this case, we're almost like Samuel, but not quite. We are called to service. We are all called to serve God. What's the chief end of man? What's our end, our goal? Well, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But what is amazing as we grow up in our faith and as we take seriously this claim on our lives, not to do the right thing, to try hard enough to follow the rules, but rather to respond to this loving, gracious God who has saved us, changed us, transformed us, rescued us, is to seek to do things that please Him, to seek to do the things that He sets before us in this world. We're called to service, every one of us in our baptism, called to salvation, called to service, to serve God. How do you do that? Well, if you want a long list of rules and regulations, that does exist. It may not be the best way to guide you. Best way may be to be to follow Jesus' command. And his primary command, this new command I give you, is to love one another. Start with that. Start with love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and that will get you pretty pretty far down the road. The call to service. Yesterday, uh, one of my dear friends, and you know him, uh, or at least his wife, uh, better maybe than him, but Ken Woods Henderson uh, over at the Northway Church was honorably retired at Presbytery yesterday. And he told just a tiny little bit of his story. Many of us who have been called to ordain ministry, ministry of word and sacrament, and we use that terminology for anybody in the process and those who are eventually come into this way of living. Uh, this is a call on our lives. But many of us have experienced actually a pretty specific call. This is what you're supposed to do. But Ken was great in talking about it yesterday. He said it came out of the blue, completely unexpected, came to a person you would not expect. And he is a gifted pastor, loving pastor, has touched, oh, countless lives over his career, which is not really a career, but his time serving in his ministry. But he said this, if God's calling you, I'm going to paraphrase now. I mean, you can run and you can hide and you can try to ignore it. He's like, just, just don't. If you hear God calling your name, just don't. You won't get away from it. He said for him, it was like a lioness grabbing a cub by the nape of the neck, the scruff of the neck and picking him up. Sometimes we need to be grabbed and, 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 and rescued bodily by God. But he said, it's just not worth it. He's going to keep after you. You might as well respond. Here I am, Lord, speak for your servant is listening. Two calls today, right? Jesus' call to the first disciples, as well as God's call on Samuel's life. The responses are really important. And I'll get to the disciples and I'll get to Samuel. We've talked about Samuel already a good bit. But let's talk about Eli. Samuel, my son, tell me everything the Lord told you. Don't hide from me anything. And Eli seems to know it's not going to be good news. But he's willing to hear it. And he does. And then he responds. He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Somebody I read this week said this was a prayer of resignation. To me, that sounds like somebody who just hangs his head. I can't do anything fine. I'm not sure it's a prayer of resignation so much as it's a prayer of relinquishment. And that is a term I use uh, advisedly. If you're a guidepost person, guidepost this month has... uh, article from 1974 or 1976, somewhere back in the day, uh, from Catherine Marshall, specifically on the prayer of relinquishment. And I'll sum up very quickly and carefully, if I can, uh, what the differences are. Most of our prayers are cries out to God for help. And then sort of the next tier that happen most often are specifically asking God to do something in our lives or somebody else's life to heal, to save, to help. Lord, help me in this case. That's the cry. Lord, heal this disease. That's the second sort of prayer. 
Along the way, we can find ourselves really trying to lean on God, put the pressure on a little bit, and God, you got to do this, and you got to do it by this time, in this way. This is hard for a pastor and a preacher, because on the one hand, of course, Jesus said, Persistent, persistence in prayer is a good and godly thing. And he told the parable about the persistent widow who hounded the judge, hounded the judge, and finally he gave her justice, not because he cared for her, because he wanted to get rid of her. Jesus' point is not God's like that. Jesus' point is God's the one who wants to hear you and wants to answer you. So he is quick to answer your prayers, and sometimes we have to be persistent. Catherine Marshall's point is there is a point at which persistence becomes just grabbing, cleaning, clinging, prying, trying to manipulate God to do what it is we want to do, what we so desperately want to do. What she lays out nicely, uh, it needs to be a lot fuller, but it's nice in a short article, what can happen. Let me check that. What always ought to happen, though the results are not always what she says. What always ought to happen is that in the midst of our persistence, in the midst of our knees being rubbed raw from pleading for God to answer this prayer, she says there's the prayer of relinquishment where we say, Lord, essentially what Eli said, you are God. Do what is good in your eyes. Because in this case, I can't make it happen. I can't seem to make you do it. And I don't know what's going to happen in the end. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust in you as a good and loving and holy and caring and providential God. And I'm leaving it in your hands because I can't make it happen myself. The neat thing about the Guidepost article is, of course, that in many situations when people finally get to the prayer of relinquishment, I can't do it, but he is God. So God, do what you're going to do. Amazingly, sometimes the prayer of relinquishment immediately uh, results in an answered prayer. Pretty much what you were wanting the whole time. The weakness is that that doesn't always happen. But the strength is that when we give up and just let God do what God's going to do, we are trusting in God's nature, God's character, God's attributes of love and care and mercy and grace and providence And it's the right way to go. Eli's response to what is going to be the call on his life, this is what your life's going to look like, is he is the Lord. Let him do what seems good in his eyes. Philip's response to Jesus saying, follow me. That's his call, follow me. And he goes, he drops everything, just like Simon and Andrew have already done. He goes to Nathaniel, he's so excited. We found the one, we found the Messiah. Nathaniel, not so much at first. Nazareth, what good thing can come from Nazareth? And so Nathaniel gets a second call. Come and see. Philip hears, follow me. Nathaniel hears, come and see. And then his response is exactly right. Nathaniel meets the Lord and he says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Worship. It's a good response to the call. All of us are called. All of us are called to serve God and glorify God in whatever place he has put us and doing whatever it is that we do with most of our days. Every single one of us called to bring glory to God and to know God's delight in us and love for us. Every one of us is called to service in that same way, right? That we are called to serve God in what we do. And by God's grace, we've been called to salvation that we also might enter into eternal life. He is the Lord. He will do what is good, not only in his eyes, but in the end, what we will see as the greatest, highest good. But let us with Samuel be those listening for our names, listening for the call of the one who knows us inside and out, has known us for eternity, calling us by name so that we can say, here am I. Speak, Lord. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, speak to us, call us, assure us of your love for us, nudge us in the right direction that we might serve you even in how we relate to one another and how we live and how we love, how we forgive and forbear, how we show that we have heard good news. We've heard great news and it has changed us that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and in him we have life not only abundantly but life eternal and forgiveness of our sins. Help us to rejoice in that and always be willing to listen to your call. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.